have believed this world alive Come back down and sit beside your feet tonight Wherever I am, you'll always be More than just a memory Well, if I ever leave this world alive Hey folks, Professor Finn here, and today we're going to be talking about what to wear in the prep room. Now, I want to open this with just a general statement that what you're going to wear in the prep room is going to be determined by your employer. And some of the more old school type funeral directors are going to be completely okay with you just going in there wearing whatever it is that you just wore in the service. Uh, take your you know suit jacket off. If you're wearing a tie, take the tie off uh, and then throw an apron and PPEs on over that. Honestly, personally, that's your business model. You do what you want. I am telling you that is extraordinarily uncomfortable. Uh, and I can say that because that's the way I started. I would just take my tie and shirt off, put an apron on over that, put on my gloves, mask, you know, away we go. Uh, that is less than ideal. So today I am going to tell you how you should be dressing perhaps uh, in your on-campus laboratories, uh, how you should ideally dress in a prep room or a prep center uh, with the goal that you will not be taking services out. Now, with that caveat, especially in small funeral homes, you will have multiple duties. Uh, you should always have a crash kit. You should have a crash kit for funeral directing so that you have professional gear and shoes and socks and hose and whatever that you need. And you should also have a prep room crash kit in case you get asked to work in the prep room that day, which will consist of whatever is appropriate for your business model to be wearing in the prep room. So the first thing we will talk about is those things which shall not be mentioned, which are your unmentionables or your undergarments. So not going to get into what um, you should be wearing in regards to your most Southern counterparts of your undergarments, um, but a general rule that can be applied with all of your undergarments is that they should be moisture wicking and cooling. Now, for today's uh, little webinar here, I am wearing an Under Armour t-shirt. This is what I would wear in the prep room, uh, so I wear my labs at uh, my full-time employer, and I will exclusively wear Under Armour t-shirts when I am working in the prep room. Disadvantages to most athletic wear like that is they will have logos that you can see through dress shirts and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you can get something that is spandexy, microfiber, moisture wicking, it will make a tremendous difference if you're spending lots of hours in the prep room in full PPE. The second thing that most people don't think about is socks. You should be wearing socks in the prep room that are made for athletic wear, especially walking and standing for long periods of time. And most athletic socks will have extra reinforcement in those tender areas so that your feet stay comfortable longer. Now, a lot of us will end up just working uh, with uh, dress socks on, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're looking for comfort, at least as comfortable as you can be, uh, a pair of athletic socks goes a long way for that. And good quality stuff. Uh, you want something that isn't just thick everywhere. You want something that is breathable, something that will, again, try to keep your feet comfortable and not wear out over time. A close second to this is shoes. Now, I have seen people wear waders, you know, rubber boots. I have seen people wear dress shoes. I have seen people wear sneakers. I have seen people wear Crocs. Uh, here are some general ideas of what not and what to wear when it comes to shoes. The first is it should not be a moisture absorbent material. So for instance, the sneakers that I'm wearing today are a pair of Nikes and they are meant for walking um, specifically. And they have like a neoprene mesh top. This is not ideal for the prep room. Not that it isn't comfortable because they are insanely comfortable, but because of the fact that if you spill anything on your shoes, your shoes are going to absorb that biological or chemical matter, which is a problem. Now, some of you be like, well, Professor Finn, you should be wearing shoe covers. Yes, you are absolutely right. But for some individuals like myself with larger shoe sizes, Shoe covers are one size fit 
all. So unless we are taking something like a Ziploc bag and putting it over our shoes and taping it down, the shoe covers will not cover all of the exposed shoe, which is ideal. Uh, generally, I find that I will rip more shoe covers uh, than I care to put on. Uh, a good alternative to this is just get something with a solid uh, membrane top, such as leather or some type of hard plastic, so that it is not just grabbing the chemicals and biological matter and wicking it into the sneaker. If you're able to cover it up with a uh, shoe cover, then life is good where what is comfortable. Some of you might wear Crocs. I have tried wearing Crocs in the prep room, and my problem is Crocs do not come in half sizes. So I'm either wearing an 11, which is too small, or a 12, which is too big, and that is my problem. Otherwise, something like a Croc is absolutely ideal because it is non-reactive to the chemicals. It is easy to disinfect when you're done. Uh, so things like nursing shoes, those things um, are, are rather ideal. You can get those from any variety of places, including large uh, big box retail stores. So don't skimp on these things, especially your shoes, because you will likely be standing for long periods in the prep room if that is going to be uh, your uh, standard duties, or if you're going in for an autopsy, you'll be there for at least two and a half, three hours. So don't skimp on the shoes. Now, what to wear normally? So we are going to assume that your employer lets you wear something for your prep room. Uh, and I would recommend under your PPEs, less ideally athletic gear. Uh, so I've had some of my students show up in workout gear, bike shorts and uh, workout top. And hey, for if you are wearing something like a full body Tyvek painter suit, which comes down to PPEs, um, that would probably be appropriate. And you should have facilities in your funeral home where you can change in and out of your PPEs. Uh, but in some older funeral homes, you might not have that shower room or employee locker room attached because that might have not been code at the time. And walking into the public areas in order to change in and out of your PPEs is inappropriate because then you're going to contaminate everything to and from the bathroom. So uh, you may have to uh, not wear athletic clothes. Uh, the most common thing people will wear are scrubs. Generally, when I see people working in a prep center, uh, and that is their full-time job, their primary duties, they are given uniforms in the form of scrubs. Now, not all scrubs are created equal. And it is important if you have never bought a pair of scrubs or you are looking at a new brand to try them on. Scrubs are notorious for having not just minuscule, but mighty differences in the same sizes between brands. So make sure that if you see a set of scrubs that you like, you try them on to make sure they fit. There are, again, a variety of materials that you can get scrubs made out of. And you can go, once again, to big box retail stores or uniform stores or online resellers or auction sites and find scrubs by the dozen. Personally, me, I look at my scrubs as, our, as an investment. And the scrubs that I wear are Dickies brand, specifically their Dynamics line for men. Now, there are unisex. Um, and there's nothing wrong with getting unisex scrubs. But if you are and have biologically male plumbing, you may find it convenient to have a zipper. Not all scrubs come with zippers. So when you are looking for a feature in a set of scrubs, make sure it has it. And what I like about the Dynamics line is it has a place for my pens, so I can just drop it right into a pocket. It has two pockets at the base of the uh, scrub top, so I can put my school ID or something in there. It has cargo style pants. It has a zipper, a button, plus a twisty tie uh, so that I can uh, tie the pants. I find this to be one of the most comfortable lines that I could possibly wear. There are pr plenty of other brands that knock this off. Get what you want is what it comes down to. But once again, this is a spandex type material that is moisture wicking and cooling, why, which is why I like this brand over a straight, say, cotton scrub, which is not nearly as moisture wicking and cooling. So everything about me is about remaining cool in my workplace. Now, not all of you are working Professor Finn style. When I am teaching a lab, 
I am teaching generally people who have never done this before. And so I am there for long periods, demonstrating, et cetera. When you get good at embalming, you're basically spending on a normal case anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half from start to finish. One of my labs can easily take two, three, sometimes even four hours on a quote unquote normal case, depending on the skill level of the people that I'm working with, the type of case we get, et cetera. And then when we're done, we have to clean the lab, which is something that you would only do at the end of the shift, but I will generally do between classes if they're stacked back to back. So my comfort in the area generally translates to happy teacher. Um, so again, I'm not endorsing any specific brand. I'm simply telling you what I use, but you really can't go wrong with moisture wicking spandex microfiber type of materials because they will keep you ultra, ultra comfortable in the workplace. So let's depart from this and real quick, let's talk about personal protection equipment. Now, under the Occupational Safety and Hazard Act, and every state has some type of OSHA thing going on your employer is responsible for providing you PPEs. Now, the PPEs they provide just needs to be the minimum to comply with the industry standard. It doesn't have to be the most fancy thing on the market. Well, if you want to get something special, you may have to pay for that out of pocket because your employer is not obligated to buy you what you want or what you would like. They're only obligated to comply with the law. So the first thing we're going to talk about is respirators. Now, there is a difference. There is a difference between a full face or a, um, sorry, a surgical mask and a respirator. A surgical mask protects against particulate getting onto your respirator. Your respirator actually is fine enough to sort out certain types of particulate in the air. Now, you, uh, through the COVID pandemic, are probably aware of N95 or N99 respirators, which stands for the amount of product that is filtered out by the respirator. And generally, these fit snugly around the nose, snugly around the mouth, so that it, you do not get any air coming in from the sides, which can lead to a problem. Surgical masks do not do that. Just plain and simple, they don't do that. Uh, a surgical mask ideally will protect a respirator from getting directly contaminated with garbage. It's like wearing two pairs of gloves. Now, um, personally, I do not like disposable respirators. They never seem to fit right. They work horrible over a uh, over a beard. So what are some options? And the first option is a half face respirator, such as a painter's mask. And there are so many brands out there, but for the sake of argument, I will simply use the brands that I have worked with, which happens to be the 3M brand. Now, their half respirator, their half mask, half face mask respirator is found in big box stores across the nation. Uh, you can buy these at virtually anywhere uh, now that the uh, buying panic is over. I personally can't stand them. I hate them. I find them uncomfortable. They are just not for me. What are some advantages of them? Well, for some people, they are extraordinarily comfortable, especially considering uh, a normal respirator might not work for them. Uh, the second thing is they use filters that can be interchanged. So you can use uh, one or two different types of filters, depending on what the use is going to be. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. Because any of these permanent respirators are only as good as the filters you are using. If the filters and gaskets are broken, you've spent money and you're not protecting yourself. The other option is a full face respirator uh, on the 3M line that's the 7000 series. Now, these are prohibitively expensive. Okay, they're prohibitively expensive. They range anywhere uh, with a. Uh, I've seen them as cheap as maybe 350 to 380 as expensive as 500. Whereas a painter's mask, you can probably pick that up between 20 and 35 bucks. And then the filters are going to cost you you know, anywhere between $12 and $30, depending on what filter you buy. Now, personally, me, I have the 7000 series 3M face mask. And now why do I have a Darth Vader mask versus the half mass respirator. Well, actually, I find this to be immensely more comfortable, like insanely so. 
The silicon on the inside that covers your mouth right here is super soft and comfortable in comparison to the others. And the other thing I like about this is it has an integrated face shield, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, another perk to this is that almost every part on this mask is replaceable. If I have to replace the straps, I can do it. Clips, I can do it. Gaskets, I can do it. Face shield, I can do it. Gasket kit, I can do it. Everything on here can be replaced and generally not for three to 500 bucks. Now, good news is if you absolutely want one of these, um, if you can find them used, which sounds a little bit grody, but at the end of the day, you're going to disinfect these anyways, um, you can get them fairly inexpensive, which is how I acquired this one. I paid probably less than 150 bucks for everything, and I just bought a new gasket kit, swapped it all out. Now, your little friends right here. Filters are important. At a minimum, at a minimum, the respirator you should be using is anti-tuberculoidal, which means it filters out tuberculosis spores. And those are really easy to come by. The pink on this one indicates that it is also, uh, it has uh, protection against organic vapors, specifically formaldehyde. As I just said, I work with newbies and beginners, and the risk of an accident is high. One of the reasons why I hate, I hate half face respirators is because if there is a problem, my eyes are still going to be exposed. And whether I'm wearing safety goggles or a face shield, generally it is not airtight. And one of the traits of formaldehyde vapor is it is extremely annoying to your mucous membranes in your eyes. Well, another reason why I like this. If I have a major problem, I can run out of the room, strap this on, run back into the room after everyone else is out, and I can go in and I can neutralize any sort of chemical problem. Has that happened? It's happened once in 10 years. But I'm able to work in comfort rather than trying to hold my breath, do something, run back out, take a couple gasps, run back in. Because when you work quick, you work sloppy, and it is more of a hazard. So personally, the reason why I have this isn't so much for prep room use, it's because I deal with people that have never done this, and in my environment, that can lead to a disaster. Um, so you will probably get laughed at if you wear something like that at work. I'm not saying all your employees and coworkers uh, are like that, but mo especially the old-timers, they just won't understand why it is you would want to wear something like that. And for me, it's kind of a no-brainer because I personally find it to be the most comfortable. Second thing you're going to wear there is a face shield. Now, the respirator is intended to protect against inhalation. A face shield is meant to protect against splashes, so nothing gets onto your skin or onto your face. If you are wearing the correct PPEs, you should have little to no bare skin anywhere showing. That includes your face. Now, I find disposable face shields also extremely uncomfortable and annoying. They slide around no matter how good the elastic is. It's always a pain in the butt. And I just can never seem to get these things right. Maybe it's because of my fat head. Maybe it's just because I don't know how to wear these things appropriately. But considering it's just a piece of stretchy Velcro elastic, I shouldn't have to go too terribly crazy uh, to figure it out. Now, what I will say is if you're going to invest uh, in a face shield, you can buy some permanent ones. And again, big box retail stores or home improvement stores are going to have these things for probably 12, 13 bucks tops. And even some discount tool shops will carry some of these things. Um, what is the difference between say a $12 one and a $50 one? And the answer to that is the harness. Okay, the harness that goes on top. Now, this is not a harness for a face shield. This is a harness for the last thing we'll talk about, which is called a headlamp. But the more expensive, generally, uh, a face shield that you purchase, the more likely the harness is going to be much more comfortable. Now, I have tried wearing the hard blue plastic ones from uh, the inexpensive shops. Uh, they give me headaches. They pinch all the right places on the side of the head, and it drives me nuts. What I found to be the most useful one that I use at work when I am not wearing a full face respirator is the Honeywell Uvex. Now, I am fully aware this has the protective blue safety coating on it because this is my demo one. This is my backup, uh, the one I usually keep in my office in case something happens to the one that I wear. And because it's contaminated, and when, after I clean it off, I treat it as uh, contaminated. This is the one that basically has been sitting in a box for two years. 
And I have found this to be probably the most comfortable face shield I have worn. Uh, what are some advantages to this over some of the more uh, less expensive ones? Well, you have a complete welder's type of mask protection to the sides of the face where on disposable face shields, maybe you get the front, but you're certainly not getting the sides. This you get some pretty good coverage on the sides, especially down near the bottom. Um, so I just find this to be a superior product. And this would be one that I recommend my students for labs. This is one I would recommend to you folks if you want to uh, invest in a hard face shield. And keeping this clean is not hard. It's called Dawn dishwashing detergent and water. That's all you need to disinfect this at the end of the day. Do not spray uh, Lysol disinfectants onto the, onto the uh, plastic face shield. It messes with the plastic and gets cloudy. Just plain Dawn dishwashing detergent is more than you'll need with some uh, litmus microfiber cloths. Now, you will have a hard time wearing one of these with a half mask respirator or something else. So if you're looking to protect yourself against formaldehyde vapor, you may have to look into alternative situations, um, which at the end of the day, many of you will not wear something like that, or you'll figure it out as you go. Now, the last thing, and this is especially helpful to newbies, and I see more and more old pros using these, uh, are headlamps. Now, you can go to your big box home store, you can go to your big box retail stores and go into the home improvement section and get yourself you know, one or two AA battery head uh, flashlights. They'll work just great, okay? They work fine, I've used them. I, sp I spent not a small amount of money over three to five years purchasing different headlamps uh, on auction sites just to see which ones work best, which ones are total crap, what get the job done, what's good for a student, what's good for a professor, etc. And what I will say is headlamps are completely unnecessary for what we do as embalmers. Do they make your life easier? Most certainly they do. Okay, most certainly they do. And some headlamps are extraordinarily cheap. You can buy a three watt battery pack headlamp off of an auction site or an online retailer for probably less than 20 bucks. Um, are they useful? Yeah. At the end of the day, they're better than nothing. Okay. They're better than nothing, but they are more expensive generally than the $12 double A one, uh, that you can buy from your uh, retail store. So which one should you get? And the moral of the story is whichever one you feel comfortable investing in. The lights matter. Okay. The color of the lights especially matter because certain colors will enhance the natural color of tissues as you're working, which for uh, embalmers, we need to see and differentiate what it is that we are blunt dissecting um, through. So trying to distinguish um, a uh, fascia covering from, say, a compressed vein can be, extraordinary diff can be extraordinarily difficult with the naked eye. The proper color LED can help bring that out just a little bit so that you can kind of see the slight color variance between those two. Uh, and certainly locating arteries is so much easier when you have the right type of colors. Now, headlamps, especially surgical headlamps, can get into the thousands of dollars, okay? And I am spoiled. I, a couple of years ago, had the opportunity to work with a team of plastic surgeons, and all these doctors brought their toys. And uh, the, the one doctor that uh, I partnered with or worked with uh, the most uh, recommended a brand. It was the brand that he, he had, and he swore that this was the best thing since uh, humanity invented the wheel. And he was not wrong. He most certainly was not wrong. Problem is, I'm a mortician. I can't buy doctor stuff. And I don't want to pull favors and drop three Gs. Um, you heard that right, three grand. Uh, to purchase something um, like that when I can literally go down to Wally World and pick up something for 12 bucks. Um, but I have kept my eye out over time. And then over the summer, patience uh, was rewarded. I happened to find uh, an O-scope by the brand uh, that I was looking for, uh, and I got it relatively inexpensive. So this is less than ideal for what we do because we have no need for magnification, okay? We have no need for the magnification. Um, and I got this just as my summer labs were ending. So I have not really had a lot of time to play with this on cadavers, uh, but I am going to play with this in the fall and see if the magnification uh, is useful in any way, because if not, it's so hard to fix that by just flipping it up in the heck with it. Uh, why would I pay? Well, in honesty, this was not cheap, but it certainly was not $3,000 either. Uh, you know, thank you, medical surplus. So why would I buy something like this? And that is because 
Once again, the harnesses are super comfortable. You have medical professionals that are paid roughly an obscene amount of money compared to a mortician professor um, who are wearing these things for hours on end. There is a vested interest in the manufacturers of these, Vorotech, Welch Allen, we're looking at you folks, to make sure that these professionals are comfortable because people's lives depend on that. And that is the one thing that I can absolutely say about this is this harness is remarkably comfortable. What's the problem? That's not going to work with something like this. So I have to make a distinction as to what do I want to wear, or I have to use some redneck creativity to get this onto that, which with some of those uh, more inexpensive $20 headlamps, for instance, um, you don't have to get too creative. It's just a couple of screws holding it onto a little clip, take the clip off, and then get with the Gorilla Glue, maybe a Dremel, you know, make it look a little bit professional instead of just duct tape slapped to the top of it. Um, but you can get a headlamp onto one of these things. Oddly enough, I can probably get that to work easily enough with something like this because these two things may not uh, interfere with each other too terribly. But again, I haven't had the time to play with it. And if I'm wearing that, I'm usually not dissecting. That's usually well past that point. So get yourself something to help you see because learning to see is important when you are first learning the trade, if you will, learning the art. Once you know what to recognize, you'll be able to see it in lesser light conditions. And again, you can get away with a $12 headlamp uh, from any online retailer or big box retail store. If you want something to help you differentiate tissues, you need something medical grade and you have to pay for those. You can find those uh, through surplus sites and other avenues, uh, but do you need something like that? Absolutely not. You do not need something like that for school. You're not a medical resident. You're not a medical student. You don't need it. Um, $20 headlamp will be sufficient for most of you. And if you're going to purchase something like that, I would recommend a five or seven watt lamp versus the three. Threes aren't bad. The fives and the sevens are a lot brighter. And when it comes down to it, we want something bright. That doctor's one is bright, and that is why I like it. So for me, that is a worthy investment. And demonstrating, obviously, is a big thing for me because my students have to see it. So when I purchase something like this, my purposes of using something in a prep room are completely different from a full-time practitioner in industry. I am here to teach. I need things conducive to teaching. So before you say, oh, no one ever needs anything like that in the industry. Well, that's true. They probably don't. But I could definitely use something like that because I'm an educator, not just an industry professional. Would I wear that thing in a prep room? Ooh, probably not. Sorry, folks. That's just not something that um, I am going to be doing. Love autofocus, don't you? Uh, so um, I hope you found this video useful. And if there is something else you want me to talk about when it comes to PPEs or wearing something, by all means, um, throughout this video, you've seen little pictures that I've thrown up for you uh, for these different products that I've talked about. None of these are paid sponsorships. These are things that I have used, like the headlamps. I have spent money on these to see, do I like them? Do they stink? And can give a recommendation based off of my experience with, you, with them. Your experiences, not identical. You may not want to pay $35 a piece for a uh, Dynamics uh, scrub set. So you're looking at almost uh, 80, 90 bucks with shipping of scrubs for a top and a bottom if you can't find it on sale. You may just want to buy a $10 top and a $10 bottom on a clearance. By all means, knock yourself out. For me, I am about buying something that I know works and is quality. Uh, and generally, the problem with, that I have is I'm a big dude. And no one makes larger sizes that I can go and try on and see do I like it without me making an investment uh, that I would rather not make. So once I find an established brand, I'm just going to wear my established brand. So folks, hope you are all fabulous.